Hello, I'd like to thank you for attending this uh, Revcom Global Virtual Conference. Um, uh, welcome to our presentation uh, on the role of solvent deasphalting and how it fits in the refining process. Um, I'd like to thank um, the Beck team um, in true Beck fashion. This was a team effort. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Robert Omas and Mel Larson for their assistance and their extreme help in, in setting up this uh, simulation and helping to do the economics and also uh, in, in troubleshooting some of the issues related to yields of a solvent deasphalting unit. I'd also like to thank Revcom uh, for their uh, role in providing us a, a venue for presenting uh, uh, papers via uh, this virtual conference. Uh, in this uh, time and, and age of pandemics uh, and not being able to meet, this is a very creative uh, format for us to uh, be able to share our thoughts and uh, our uh, technical papers. With that, I'd like to get started. Solvent deasphalting is, um, there's a couple of takeaways on this slide. And the first one is that to increase a refinery's margin capture, you have to ensure that the right molecules are going to the right places or the right conversion units. This, this uh, molecular management approach is typically been done uh, in a refinery environment by, by cut points, by fractionation. And so in a refinery, we cut in the crude unit, we make uh, naphtha, diesel, uh, gas oil. In the vacuum unit, we make light vacuum gas oil, heavy gas oil, and, and vacuum bottoms. And all of these different cuts are then sent to different processing units. Uh, for example, the vacuum tower bottoms is sent to a delayed coker. I mean, since this is a primarily a, a delayed coking and how solvent deasphalting couples that with delayed coking, I'm going to probably emphasize coking a lot more than, than, um, than uh, might be presented in a typical solvent deasphalting presentation. But in, in the case of fractionation, that vacuum resin is, uh, is the bottom of the barrel and it's sent to the delayed coker. The solvent deasphalting process doesn't, is not a fractionation process. Instead, it's a separation process. It's a liquid-liquid extraction process. It uses, um, it uses the difference between sol uh, solubility of asphaltines and paraffins to make that separation. And, and in the extreme, we have paraffins and asphaltines. Well, in the middle, we have resins and aromatics. But in a solvent deasphalting unit, we're really focused on asphaltines and paraffins. Now, obviously, the aromatics and resins fall in between this, and that affects the, the, the type of, of separation we're actually doing in the solvent deasphalting. Um, but we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, the main, main takeaways from this slide, though, is that Increasing refinery margin capture is, required, uh, is achieved by ensuring that the right molecules end up in the right conversion units and that solvent deasphalting is not fractionation, it is a liquid-liquid extraction. The next slide here shows that the way that solvent deasphalting um, yields look is that it, uh, as the diagram shows, as I lift more, as I recover more oil and, and as opposed to pitch, I have more and more contaminants coming into the deasphalted oil. The, de the solvent deasphalting unit um, takes advantage or exploits the fact that asphaltines contain most of the contaminants. They contain most of the metals, a lot of the sulfur, a lot of the nitrogen, but a, a lot of the con carbon. It is because of the complexity and the uh, very complex molecules that asphaltines have that make it insoluble in a solvent. Whereas the deasphalted oil, when you remove that asphalt, it cleans up that deasphalted oil 
and now I have a cleaner, lighter, more paraffinic uh, de-asphalt and oil. Now, as that plot shows, the, the more I recover de-asphalt and oil, the more contaminants I'm going to get into the de-asphalt and oil. So there's an economic or operational limit where you want only so many metals and you can do only so much lifting of that of that uh, de-asphalt and oil out of that feedstock. I, I will discuss that in a little bit uh, as we go on. Before we go on to some of the details of de-asphalting, um, the, some of, just a little bit of history. Um, in the, the first process, the first patent was in 1938, uh, which it's amazing how much technology was being developed early, early in the 1900s. Uh, but in 1938, the first patent showed up on solvent de-asphalting. It was a pentane de-asphalting. And, and actually, um, uh, propane de-asphalting was around for quite a while before uh, other companies started looking at C3s, C4s, and C5s as solvents and how that affected the recovery or the lifting of de-asphalt and oil. Fundamentally, the, the heavier the molecular weight of your solvent, as you go from C3s to C5s, you start to lift more and more out of that, that, uh, out of that feedstock to the solvent de-asphalting unit. Um, that technology has been uh, increasingly improved. Um, Kermagee, now KBR, and UOP in the early 80s uh, started developing a critical, uh, supercritical solvent recovery uh, process for the separation of the solvent from the de asphalt and oil. Um, and that was one of the major improvements that we've seen recently. The, the process can be uh, simplified, and we're not going to go into a lot of the chemistry or the the mechanical uh, details of, a, of an SDA unit. We're going to basically talk about where it fits into the refinery and where the economics lie. But briefly, feed comes in at the very on, in this diagram on the upper left-hand side and flows into a mixer where we have the solvent mixing with the feed into the solvent de-asphalting unit. That mixture then goes to an asphalt separator. From that asphalt separator, you've got the asphalt falling out of solution or falling out to the bottom and going to the asphalt stripper, whereas the top of that asphalt separator now has the solvent and the de-asphalted oil. So in a, in a phrase, like dissolves like. And so the paraffins, the C4s, 5s, and 6s, or C3s, 4s, and 5s, will dissolve, those paraffins will dissolve the paraffinic material in the feedstock. And that goes then on to the de and oil separator, which is on the far right. That then goes to the de and stripper at the bottom. And now at the very bottom, we have an asphalt stripper and a de and oil stripper. And I have a pitch product and a de asphalt and oil. Those strippers, send that solvent back to a solvent recovery system, and then it repeats, you send that solvent back to the mixer. Um, the bottom line is you've got two products, pinch and de-asphalt and oil. Again, the higher the molecular weight of your solvent, uh, as you go from C3s to C5s, or even C6s, the more uh, de-asphalt and oil you're going to recover, the bigger the lift, but the bigger the lift, the more contaminants you're going to contain or get in the de-asphalt and oil. There are numerous possibilities or scenarios where we can put a, a, a solvent de-asphalting a, a solvent de-asphalting process into a refinery, uh, and ultimately it depends on a few things. It depends on the crude types being fed to a refinery. Um, crude types consistently contain sour crudes or light crudes or, or different mixtures, and you might do a solvent de-asphalting 
process for several different reasons just based on the crew times. Um, the next um, issue that might uh, motivate you for a solvent asphalting unit is existing bottom upgrade capacity. If your delayed coker um, is not large enough or your vacuum unit is not large enough, then a solvent asphalting unit might be a, a good choice uh, to supplement uh, that delayed coker or that vacuum unit shortfalls. Um, the delayed coker doesn't do well with uh, large differences in feeds, a dumbbell mix, like a very paraffinic feed and a very aromatic feed or asphaltine feed. With a combination, with a solvent the asphalting unit, you can dampen out that, that effect of a paraffin coming into your coker. You can also, like I said, supplement uh, the vacuum unit or the coker, and we'll see more of that in a minute. Um, but again, the solvent asphalting process can be used in addition to, uh, to supplement or to enhance the molecular management, sending these right molecules to the right place. There are, are uh, the major point here is that a solvent asphalting unit is not really a, a process unit unto itself. It really supplements or assists or, or um, expands the capacity of existing units or reduces the capital cost of a delayed coke or a vacuum unit. There are very few solvent de-asphalting units that are, un, that are that are above 50,000 barrels. Most of the solvent de-asphalting units are, are much smaller and are doing just what I'm saying about assisting or supplementing some uh, shortfalls or limitations in a different unit. As we said before, the SDA Solvent de-asphalting process is a good supplemental unit. It is not uh, necessarily a debottlenecking uh, de process unto itself. It helps the vacuum tower or the delayed coker. It supplements their capacity. Um, the solvent de-asphalting does not eliminate the bottoms or the con carbon. It's, it only concentrates the, the contaminants into the pitch or the resin or the as not the resin the asphalt it doesn't eliminate them uh, very there are very few solvent de-asphalting units that are above 50,000 barrels because most of these units are being used to supplement the existing process the existing vacuum unit and the existing coker uh, again it doesn't eliminate the bottoms it just concentrates the bottoms um, in today's refinery economics, we avoid the production of fuel oil products um, or pitch products. Uh, and the solvent de-asphalting pitch is generally not a good road asphalt. So uh, providing or using a solvent de-asphalting unit to make asphalt for uh, end product of asphalt for a road product, a uh, road pitch, um, does not work. So it really has to be fed to some further upgrading unit, like a delayed coker, a fluid flexi coker, an H oil or an LC finer or emulated bed of some sort. Um, the the deasphalted oil cleans up that the solvent deasphalting unit cleans up that deasphalted oil and makes it more uh, palatable or useful to the FCC or a resin FCC, which is more of an Asian or Asian type operation where they process kind of paraffinic feedstocks anyway. Um, the de-asphalted oil can be also fed to um, an ambulated bed itself. Um, it, uh, it also has traditionally been used in the production of lube oil products. Um, we don't see that too much in the United States uh, today but that's historically what a lot of solvent de-asphalting units were doing, was providing a loom stock from the de-asphalting oil. Um, in, in our analysis, we're gonna talk about a little bit 
of a, de, uh, of a solvent deasphalting unit in parallel or in series with a vacuum unit. In parallel, that solvent deasphalting unit would relieve or to unload the vacuum unit's uh, limitations and feed uh, atmospheric bottoms directly to the, to the solvent deasphalting unit. And now I have a, a pitch or a, a, a bottoms for the, as, the asphalting unit and a vacuum tower bottoms that can be fed to further um, processing, i.e. in a delayed coker. Um, the other uh, approach is a, uh, a solvent deasphalting unit in, in series with a vacuum tower. So now if a vacuum tower is not achieving a deep cut, you can provide a, a, a certain amount of that vacuum tower bottoms going into the solvent deasphalting and effectively getting a deeper cut. It's not a fractionation unit, remember that, but it will remove a large portion of that poorly cut vacuum bottoms. And now I've got a concentrated pinch and a cleaner deasphalt and oil. Um, and, and finally, uh, not finally, but in addition, there's a, a light tight oil uh, streams or crudes um, coming in that, from the Balkan and Eagle Ford. These crudes are potentially not um, uh, compatible. Uh, there are compatibility problems, especially in the coker. Um, when you have a Bakken or Ingle Ford or even a WTI, um, and you can send these kinds of crudes or, or atmospheric bottoms or resins to the SDA to try to mitigate that paraffin paraffinicity of the, of the vacuum tower bottoms from a sweet crude and the sour crude bottoms and trying to mix a sour crude and a sweet crude together and then having compatibility problems. Um, these compatibility problems show up in, in excess of fouling, especially in the coker. One of the configurations, and this is in case one, and shows what we were talking about, where I've taken the vacuum tower bottoms and sent it to a SDA unit. Now, this is a, a um, common approach or a, a typical approach. Um, and in this case, we're going to send a sweet crude's uh, bottoms from the vacuum unit to an SDA. But on the other hand, on the right hand side, I have a sour crude and its vacuum tower bottoms are going directly to the coker. So now I've got a pitch from the solventy asphalting unit, which has been made, it makes a pitch that looks more like the VTPs from the sour crude uh, unit, and now I eliminated, eliminated the solubility problem and my coker will operate much better. Um, the next case is a case where we brought in, um, similar to the first, but in this case, we've just got a crude supply. We're not looking at uh, the type, different types of crudes, but we're looking at a um, supplement in the vacuum unit we're also bringing in an external or purchased fuel oil. In this case, we're doing two things. We're supplementing the vacuum towers, perhaps as a poor cut in the vacuum tower, and we're bringing in an external or purchased fuel oil. Purchased fuel oils tend to have a significant amount of cutter, and sending that cutter directly, or that external purchased fuel oil to the coker directly, puts a lot of heat load or firing duty load on the coker or fractionator or all of the above. And so a, a solvent deasphalting unit would unload the coker and provide a way of getting that cutter outside or, ex, or removing that cutter from the feed to the coker. In this case is probably the configuration we see more often. It is a case where we've got a solvent and deasphalting um, unit taking some of the vacuum tower bottoms, not all, and unloading the um, vacuum tower's poor lift, perhaps, or, or not lift, but uh, cut, and 
uh, again, supplementing the vacuum tower and also supplementing the, the, the Glenn Coker by lifting out some of that vacuum tower bottoms uh, light material and making de-asphalt and oil out of it. I'm taking feed out of going to the coker out of the coker and now sending it to gas oil process, processing, which helps eliminate or reduce the uh, firing capacity in the coker. So these are the cases that we're, uh, we're, we, we, we've looked at and seen. And this last case is the case where we're probably going to focus we're going to focus on on the economics. Again, uh, this slide shows that um, because of the um, uh, issues with the uh, fuel oil uh, sales and the high sulfur fuel oil sales uh, and the IMO 2020 restrictions for uh, high sulfur fuel oil, it, it has made um, the availability of, of rather inexpensive feedstock to the coker. The problem with this is that cutter that, that's contained in that fuel oil um, takes a big load or requires a big load in the coker. The solid deasphalting unit can be used to eliminate that uh, ex excess load from the coker. The, the coker is a proven economically proven um, bottom of the barrel processing unit. It's very good at handling high con carbon, uh, to some degree high asphaltines, high metals, uh, high contaminants, whereas other units in the refinery cannot. The solvent deasphalting process, again, provides that molecular management that uh, we're looking for in providing what's good for the coker contaminants or what the coker can handle the contaminants and then limit and, and then producing a deasphalted oil which are better handled in other units that don't that cannot handle the contaminants so the, the combination of a solid deasphalting unit and a delayed coker is a very good um, mix or match uh, economically to effectively evaluate how a solvent deasphalting economics fit in a refinery, it is uh, almost it is required that, uh, in, that it be looked at the solvent deasphalting yields uh, be looked at in the whole refinery. You cannot just look at the yields from the from the deasphalting unit, but you have to look at it in conjunction with how it affects the coker, the vacuum unit the hydrotreeners, um, all the other units in that, in that refinery. A whole refinery simulation is possible to quickly and easily measure how, how these solvent deasphalting units can best fit in an existing refinery or in a grassroots refinery to, to supplement or reduce the capital cost of a coker vacuum unit kind of operation. Bent now can simulate a complete refinery with all the details and the individual uh, reactive units and blending products uh, to look and determine what is the optimum configuration for a solvent deasphalting unit inside a refinery. Again, it has to be done within the context of the whole refinery. With that said, we simulated um, a solvent the asphalting unit um, and a delayed coker and put it in the context of a whole refinery model. In the simulation we took, and it couldn't, these are variables that can be adjusted, these were just variables we chose. I took 70% of all the vacuum tower bottoms and sent it to the SDA unit. And I took 30% directly to the delayed coker. Now, in this model, we have a relatively small delayed coker. It's a two drum coker. It can't handle a whole lot more feed. And in this case, we did not change the feed to the refinery. We kept it fixed. But later on, you're gonna see how it could have been possible to actually have increased the, 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 uh, 
in the crude rate, or even maybe in the crude times. But those variables were not adjusted. It was strictly looking at a 70-30 split in the VTP and different lifts for the solvent deasphalting and how it affects the different products. Like I said, the delayed coker itself was a small delayed coker, less than 25,000 barrels, two drums, a 26 uh, foot diameter drum, uh, coker, which in this refinery model fit okay with a 16 hour cycle, which is very typical. Uh, the, drum, the drum overhead temperature was 825, pretty common uh, overhead temperature. The drum pressure was 19 pounds, which is also very common, and a recycle of 10% or a CFR of 1.1. So these operating conditions were uh, very common, very typical. It's not a large coker, and that's probably going to influence or will influence the economics uh, to a large degree. So the summary of results is, um, is split up into three parts. The far left is the, the delay coker alone without an SDA unit. Um, the middle um, graph or table is the uh, solvent deasphalting with a 20% lift. And you can see um, the different results and yields from that, compare, uh, from that operation. Um, and then the far right is the 40% lift. So we have a no lift or no solvent deasphalting case on the left. The middle is the 20% lift, and the far right is the 40% lift. Some of the highlights to look at this are uh, basically, fundamentally, the, the solvent deasphalting unit, as I lift more and more, produces more gas oil product overall between the coker and the uh, SDA unit. So effectively, I'm making more liquid products and slightly less coke, but more liquid products, heavy gas oil products. Um, there's also some other benefits that are, that are uh, calculated and determined or estimated in the model, and that's the C factor or the velocity in the coke drum itself. As you can see on the very far left, the coker alone, or standalone coker, had a C factor right in its limit. We're not going to be able to put too much more into that coker or lower the pressure in that coker because it's already got a C factor that's quite high, 0.31. When I went to the 20% uh, lift uh, SDA unit, I noticed now that the C factor drops to 0.27 and then drops further with a 40% lift. That is giving us effectively more capacity as a function of velocity. I can either lower the pressure and reduce the coke yield, or I might be able to add more feed. I, I did not change the cycle time and still maintain about a 16 hour cycle, but on the, on the standalone coker, it's right at 16 hours. And now when I go from 20 to 20% to, uh, lift, and 40% lift, I noticed that the cycle time is starting to expand or get larger, which means I have effectively more capacity in my coke drum and I can feed more feed to the coker. That was not done in this uh, economic evaluation, but it could have been done. Um, additionally, there's some foaming factor, and these are rough estimates, but you can see what the estimates are predicting less foaming as I went from standalone coker, 20% lift, 40% lift in the SDA. Um, it's interesting that the foaming factor almost drops to nothing or close to nothing because of the compatibility issues between the feedstocks. I'm not having a lot of, of paraffins in my feed and I'm not having a lot of mismatch, which tends to be a foaming issue. So in this analysis, we're seeing some incidental, not yield related kind of benefits or reliability uh, benefits to the coker. The, the larger or more, maybe more significant, 
is the fire and duty change. And it's um, not, not surprising that the fire and duty, as I lift more out in the solvent deasphalting unit, I'm sending less material to the coker. So I'm, I'm seeing a much lower fire and duty. Again, the, the results indicate I probably could have increased feed rate or hemmed up the crude slate slightly to backfill the coker and improve the economics even more. But that was not done in this economic evaluation and we are only looking at the yield effects alone. With that said, with the 20% lift, we saw a um, improvement on the crude margin of 26 cents per bar a crude barrel or an annual uh, benefit of $15, um, uh, $15 million a year on the 20% lift. Um, now, this analysis was done on a fictitious uh, ref refinery configuration. It was done on a fictitious set of, of economics. Um, the economics uh, also indicate overall that there is a very, uh, very favorable crude economics to start with, which probably uh, in, is influencing uh, why we're getting some very, very attractive economics on the solvent deasphalting unit itself. But bear in mind, we did not fully optimize in the 20% case. We could have further increased the economics by changing crude slates or increasing the crude rate. That, these are the results for the 20% lift. On the 40% lift, we almost see a doubling. It's not quite doubling, and I wouldn't expect it to be exactly double, but we saw an increase of 40 to 43% cents per barrel of crude uh, on the crude economic margin, and the um, yearly increase of $28 million a year. Again, these economics are being influenced by the assumptions of the uh, crude pricing and product pricing, and also the fictitious um, uh, configuration of the coker and all the downstream equipment. Only the coker um, was uh, fully constrained uh, or uh, put in at a limit or uh, operating limit uh, to start with. When, does it, when is it possible that an SDA unit it does not make sense in a refinery environment? Because uh, we've seen this before. Um, it doesn't make sense when the coker has sufficient capacity. If you have a delayed coker, let's say you have a very large delayed coker, and you're not pushing the delayed coker to its full limit, you're operating with greater than 16 hours, your heat flux is low on your fired heater, your fractionator and your gas recovery system isn't um, being taxed, there's no flooding problems, you're operating at a low, operating, uh, low pressure in your comb drums, your vacuum cut point might be a deep cut. In, in those cases, the, um, the need or the, uh, the ability of a solvent deasphalting unit to actually supplement the process or the economics isn't going to help. Um, a solvent deasphalting unit in that situation or in those scenarios might not have the economic uh, incentive and might not be worth in, uh, in, uh, installing or investing in. But to do this, to do this evaluation, um, you have to, um, to do the refinery model simulation. You have to look at the whole refinery in context. You cannot look at it uh, as one single unit or one set, a yield set just from the solvent the asphalting unit. It has to be evaluated uh, at a whole refinery level. Um, Beck Engineering um, is developing, has developed the skill sets for uh, some time now to do these kinds of evaluations. Um, Beck Engineering has developed an extensive team in process engineering and simulation work. 
as I mentioned before, I'm, I'm deeply appreciative of the teamwork I uh, was uh, afforded by uh, Mel Larson and Robert Omas, who are heading up this effort in process, develop, uh, process simulation work. Um, um, there is a, a, a large team working to do just that. It's a multidisciplined staff that approaches refinery optimization to improve capital mar or operating margin uh, from not just a process point of view, but from a reliability and sustainability point of view. With that in mind, um, here's our contact information. We would be pleased to discuss how an SDA unit might be uh, best fit in your current operations uh, or how any other unit or optimization might be done at a whole refinery level. Thank you.